Program director John Manelli. New York Magazine, in a shameless attempt to increase its anemic circulation, is running a cover story on WABC's Bob Grant with the grossly irresponsible headline, Why He Hates Blacks. That's on the cover of half of the magazines. The other half of this week's issues has Farrakhan protege Conrad Muhammad on the cover with the headline, Why He Hates Jews. New York editor Kurt Anderson, formerly with Spy Magazine, which went out of business altogether, had this to say to the Post about the twin covers. It helps make clear that both of these guys are peddling hate. Peddling hate? Even before the magazine hit the newsstands, New York's publicity people had the nerve to try to get Bob Grant to do television interviews. New York's publicity people. So who's peddling hate? The article tries badly and fails miserably to prove that Bob Grant is racist. And the PC policeman who wrote it goes on to express additional shock and outrage over what Bob has dared to say about people too old to drive, teenage girls who drive, Mario Cuomo, environmentalists, fat people make that calorically enhanced people, and even, how dare he, Hillary Clinton. Who knew that when New York Magazine overhauled its layout a couple of weeks ago, they were also turning into a cheesy tabloid? If you want authoritative exposés, get the National Enquirer. Opposing viewpoints are welcome, as long as they're truthful. Let's get to our telephones. Uh, John from Staten Island, hello. Hello, Bob. Bob. Take the best you can get out of that lying article in New York Magazine, the publicity for your show, which uh, will only enlighten even more people when they tune into your show now. And don't concern yourself with the rest, because we've got these stinking, no goodness liberals on the run, Bob. You know, Abraham Lincoln said, what kills a skunk is the publicity it gives itself. And you can smell a liberal a mile away. Just watch for the name-calling when they have nothing to refute what you say. Liberals know that with the way things are today, Bob, the worst thing you can be called in America is a racist. Your life can be ruined. That's why the first utterance from, those, uh, from the mouths of those anti-American leech invaders who demonstrated against Governor Wilson in California was to call him a racist in knee-jerk fashion, picking up on the chant of the domestic haters. And uh, by the way, Governor Wilson isn't trying to take the benefits away from American citizens who are minorities, so how can he be called a racist? You know, Bob, you're, you're not supposed to point out that uh, the 11 rapes that occurred in Central Park this year were committed by black thugs against white women. That in the last six weeks alone, a black riding a bicycle in Manhattan stabbed three whites only. The attack and the rape the other day by two blacks and a Hispanic on the couple sitting in their car on a pier in Brooklyn. The only white man in a white castle in West Hempstead, Long Island, was beaten and stomped on by 15 blacks. The rape of the woman under the Coney Island boardwalk. And you know, Bob, a 21-year-old black stripper was arrested for uh, killing a Brooklyn cabbie during a $30 robbery. Chantel Candy Johnson and two other friends they got into a cab driven by an Ecuadorian native, Carlo Uchia, 32. They asked him to take them to uh, East New York. When they got to East New York, they had uh, intended to run out without paying. Instead, they murdered this man for $30. And they asked why they're not picked up and why cabbies don't want to go to East New York. That, was a, that wasn't called a racist uh, murder, Bob. But uh, when a group of whites beat an illegal Mexican immigrant to death in early September of this year. That was labeled a base of biased crime. Bob, none of these things that I spoke about, where blacks were the perpetrator and whites were the victim, none of them have been labeled a racial attack. Where is Mario Cuomo's uh, anti-racist bias act? That was, of course, never passed, uh, never intended to uh, get black people. It was only intended to uh, do in whites. And where are the women's livers groups, Bob? Not yeah. one of them, those groups, have spoken out for all of these white women that were attacked because they would have to criticize blacks. No, they were too busy demonstrating outside of Hooters Restaurant in Philadelphia because they were more concerned about the type of clothes the lady waitresses were wearing. They are pathetic, aren't they, Bob? Uh, Magnificent John, very good. Thanks Thank very you. much. 
On WABC, Bob Grant here. George over there in Jersey City calling in right now. Hello, George. Hello, Bob. It's good to speak to you. Bob, I didn't get a chance to pick the, uh, the magazine up yet, but I just want you to know that people that have listened to you for years, and your supporters, we all know that you judge individuals. Now, whatever shoe they might fit on, that's the way you are. And, uh, I mean, that's the way it is. And uh, we, we stand behind John Manelli's uh, editorial. I thought it was great. Now, one thing I want to say, Bob, is going back a few months ago, uh, one of your colleagues was branded about as a racist by the President of the United States. Now, I remember you, for one, if I'm not mistaken, even had him on the telephone, came out in support of him, knowing that this was wrong of the President, and you, you backed this colleague 100% saying that it was a wrong thing for the president to say, and you know that he's not like this. Now, for a man of his audience and has a big following in New York, and I'm quite sure people all over the country might get a chance to buy this magazine and pick it up, not that Bob Grant need anybody to come to his defense, but you would think that one time, and I made it a point to listen to his program today, one time that he would mention this, about a local talk show hostess who's branded, being branded this way, and he know for a fact it's not true. Not once did the man mention it, never said anything about it, and it just goes to prove what I always thought of this man, is he is an egotistical maniac that thinks of nobody but himself. Uh, George, I appreciate the call. I, I, I thank you very much, George. Thank you, Bob. Okay, George from Jersey City right here on W. A, B, C. Again. Good morning, uh, Joe. Good morning, Curtis. Good to hear from you again. Now, Joe, one of the very first times I ever heard you, uh, other than a 30-second soundbite, was on the Bob Grant show when your critics were mounting a uh, sort of broadside attack. Um, what were your experiences with Bob Grant over the years? Well, going back to 1983 through 1990, uh, my ideologies, philosophies, and stand, stands pertinent to education were always buttressed by Bob Grant. Uh, I did receive, personally, uh, great support from uh, Bob Grant and WABC when, in fact, there was a, a dearth of support from other arenas. So my experiences, personally, with Bob Grant have been very positive. Well, now, he's been uh, called uh, a racist, one who is uh, anti-black. Uh, you've dealt with him personally, up close and personal, and naturally on the radio. Uh, what were your experiences? My personal re experiences uh, were very uh, productive. I found him to uh, listen carefully to what I said and generally support what I did represent. Uh, I recognize, however, that Bob Grant nor any other host or hostess is impeccable. There are flaws and there are areas that do cause uh, concern and consternation. But my relationship, my personal involvement, and that's how I like to take my people one-on-one, -on -one. I can't speak collectively for anyone, Has they have been very formidable, and he, on many occasions, served as a very powerful buffer between me and a hostile uh, group of individuals after my posterior. And this, uh, if I remember, when many an Afro-American broadcaster, uh, what we could almost call your brothers of the skin... Uh, I, I want to make something very, very clear. Uh, because you are black does not mean anything except that you are black and I am black. That does not make you my brother. Uh, I, I'm not going to be succumb to such fatuous and ridiculous nonsense because the annals of history does not indicate that black people in Africa and long before they were ever called Africa had any type of commonality linguistically, biologically, or culturally. So that kind of stuff ultimately is made of the stuff that makes tomatoes grow. I don't want to hear that. I like to take people one-on-one -on -one and how they uh, portray themselves to me as decent human beings in our society. All right, Joe Clark, you came out of Newark, a city that has produced, well, the likes of Al D'Amato, Ed Koch, and a whole host of other great Americans.
You've been New Jersey through and through. Christine Todd Whitman has been, well, almost the queen of New Jersey. She seems to be unable to do any wrong. This morning's Bergen record, she's up in the polls. She could well be the vice president on a Republican ticket versus Bill Clinton the next time around. How, how do you see the move that she made on Bob Grant on Friday? Well, what's your perception? I am a black American. I am a free black American, a conservative Republican, uh, free thinking, enjoy sharing my views with others, and I hope that individuals are receptive to the fact that they will not confuse my pigmentation with my politics. Mm. I personally was alarmed. I was alarmed because, in my humble opinion, there was a blatant display of lack of character. Bob Grant, if for nothing else, did categorically and consistently go on the path, on the campaign trail, with uh, Governor Whitman, ensuring, in fact, that her election would become an eminent factor. And now, abruptly and all of a sudden, I see her lash out at a man who she had to know about, who she had to know about his ideolog ideologies and philosophies. And all of a sudden, as a result of some other exigencies that may have arisen, she has thrust him aside as though he was an unwanted old putrid shoe. All right, Joe, I find could, it disrespectful. Joe, could you hold that thought for a second? We've got to take a quick break. But there are always circumstances that throw a monkey wrench into that. I'd like to take you back, a personal situation that I had, and you can check the facts because this is record. Oh, it must have been uh, in the heyday of Bob Grant's time at WMCA. I was sitting in the headquarters of the Guardian Angels in Seattle off of Pike Street and First, right in the shadow of the international fish market that many people have seen uh, in movies and advertisements. It was in Pioneer Square, and a call came through from Bob himself. He was trying to track me down because... A sheriff from Haytai, Missouri. Haytai is just south of Cape Girardeau, a place you've all come to know because, as you know, it's the hometown of Rush Limbaugh. But anyway, this is a small, little, sleepy village, Haytai, Missouri. And Bob was being requested by the sheriff to track down the guardian angels because one Andre Robinson, who was part of the Make-A-Wish Foundation, a recipient of a gift by the Make-A-Wish Foundation, was in a nearby cancer ward in Memphis, Tennessee, and the diagnosis was that he would probably only live maybe three months. He had only one wish, Chip, and that was to come to New York and patrol with the Guardian Angels. I mean, here's a kid in Haytai, Missouri. Closest place we had in operation was St. Louis, but I'm sure the kid did not have any special relationship with the Guardian Angel concept, but he insisted. They tried to convince him. Don't you want to go with Michael Jackson? Don't you want to go see one of your favorite football stars, baseball stars, or basketball stars? And the kid insisted. So finally, the sheriff, who was solicited by the hospital there to find the Guardian Angels, contacted Bob Grant, and Bob Grant arranged for this young man to be transported to New York. He contacted Donald Trump. Donald Trump provided a suite for him and his family at the San Moritz Hotel on Central Park South. They were provided meals at Tavern on the Green. Again, this arrangement was made by Bob Grant at WMCA, and a limousine was provided by a New Jersey outlet, the name escapes me, so as to give Andre Robinson and his family an opportunity to tour New York City while also going on patrol with the Guardian Angels. Andre Robinson was an Afro-American young man whose parents were Afro-American, and I'm not talking light-skinned. I'm talking a proud, young, black, Afro-American man. And when Andre Robinson came to New York, the very first place he went after settling in at the San Moritz was to WMCA to do a broadcast. And you know who was the guest before Andre Robinson came on the air? Daryl Dawkins, chocolate thunder, who had just been traded to the New Jersey Nets that were playing in Parsippany, New Jersey, all-world Daryl Dawkins, best known for breaking rims and backboards all throughout the NBA, a very proud young black man from uh, Sarasota, Florida. And this young man had a double header. 
he was able to see his his favorite NBA basketball player who was being interviewed by Bob Grant. And Bob Grant then interviewed Andre and his mother and his family. And then naturally myself as Curtis Lee or the guardian angel who would be his host for the three days who would take him on patrol into the deepest parts of East New York, Brownsville, and the South Bronx. Well, Andre Robinson, although you could see the life literally leaving his frail body, was so in ecstasy over these three days, these 72 hours, when he literally was the king of New York. And Bob Grant made sure that that trip would be a full one, would be a pleasant one, and it turned out it was his last one. Six days later, we received the tragic news from his mother in Haiti, Missouri. Andre Robinson had passed from this plane. Now, I could not have provided this for Andre. No one else could. And the only media person in all of New York who seemed to give a damn about this young boy and his family and his last wish was Bob Grant. I tried to get other media outlets, the tabloids, the TV stations, the other radio stations, and their talk show hosts interested. Nothing. Only Bob Grant. Wasn't a white young man. Wasn't a Casper Milktoast family. It wasn't a family from Father Knows Best or Leave It to Beaver Land or Little House on the Prairie. It was Andre Robinson. I don't think a racist would have gone the whole nine yards. And in terms of differences of opinion that I've had with Bob Grant over the years, let me give you some insight. We've had some uh, titanic battles here over the airwaves when we've had ideological differences. And sometimes it has brought us to the edge where past friendship and past recognition of uh, the service that Bob granted to Lisa and myself and providing uh, for us an opportunity to broadcast here on WABC by giving us an opportunity when he was away on sabbatical or vacation to substitute for him when we were like treading water. Much of that was uh, sort of put on hold. I'll tell you of a particular time when I should have been kicked the hell out of here, quite frankly, for some of my... Uh, chicanerous uh, operations in the morning and chip akins you were here you remember i was cheating as a broadcaster some of us cheat when we can't do a really good job and we sort of try to piggyback off of the other head honchos in radio and bob grant made the world turn and uh, what happened was i was taking a task by management for using cuts on the bob grant show I shouldn't have done that. Should have come up with my own information. My own broadcasting ability should have been tested. And I was brought into the big suits. And I could have been drawn and courted. But Bob Grant said only one thing to me. He said, it's not that you did it. It's not that I feel that you could be a better broadcaster by going in a different direction. But if you had a disagreement, why couldn't you pick up the phone? Why couldn't you come into my office? Why couldn't you have discussed it with me man to man, face to face? He taught me a lesson that day. He also didn't throw his gauntlet down and said, it's either him or me, because I would have been on the outside looking in. But maybe Christine Todd Whitman could have learned from that a little bit, huh? Maybe pick up the phone, talk with Bob, counsel him, tell her she had a problem, try to figure out some kind of middle situation to resolve what she found was a newfound difference. Let's go to our busy phone lines, 212-563-WABC. We're awaiting the arrival of... Roy Innes, chairman of CORE, and his son, Niger Innes. From New Jersey, 201-489-WABC. From Connecticut, 203-862-WABC. As uh, we continue to discuss a controversy that exploded on Friday involving Christine Todd Whitman's rejection of longtime friend and political ally, Bob Grant. Hey, Chris, that's a tough act to follow right after Joe Clark. Yes. But anyway, uh, I just want to point out something. This... There is a really Byzantine angle to this whole thing here. Um, now, look at, imagine you're, you're the Svachim in Albany. Mm -hmm. Okay, you've seen Bob Grant help mow down the Flim Flam Man. Yes. You see your, your own number sliding, and you see for the first time in 12 years you have a serious challenger. So he becomes desperate, irrational. He's got friends in, in the liberal media all over New York. Yes. You know that. He's got friends in, in, the, in the Democratic Party and also the Democratic organizations. I see the fine hand of Carville and Begala behind the scenes here. Mm. You find a couple of losers who used to work for Spy Magazine who now head up uh, a, a, a flaring, really in bad shape, New York Magazine, convince them to go ahead and, and do that story, timed so that a week later... 
they can have Christy Whitman assaulted by ten so-called activist ministers in order to Pearl Harbor Bob. Mm. It's a classic rule of war. If you have to attack a superior force, you don't attack head-on. You faint to one side, that side attacks, then you attack the weakened flank, and that's exactly what they're trying to do. They're trying, they're trying to essentially surround him and collapse him because they realize what a threat he is. That's why Al is full of it. I mean, Bob, or that, not Al, but that guy who said that Bob really didn't help Chris, he's full of it because they're afraid of him. Well, to give you an example, Ray, of the strategy being employed, if you look at today's daybook in terms of New Jersey events, the Reverend Jesse Jackson discusses voter registration at uh, the AME Church, St. James in Newark. Now, you know he's going to be commenting on this Bob Grant controversy. Oh, every, every, oh yeah, every jackal in, in, uh, with an activist cause in the city is salivating over this. Well, not only that, check this out. A dynamic duo of people who have been adversaries of Bob Grant, Senator Frank Lautenberg, according to the papers now in a very tight re-election race, will have a press conference with Congressman Bob Torricelli. Because right, one... they're going to attack, they're gonna attack uh, Hattayan for, for not distancing himself from Bob. Meanwhile, they're forgetting that two weeks ago, before the story broke in New York, Bob told Chuck on the radio, I heard him publicly say, he says, Chuck, if distancing yourself from me, if denouncing me will help you beat Lassenberg, please denounce me. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sure he would have said the same thing in private to Christy Whitman if she called him. Yes, he would have. And, in fact, uh, he would be true uh, both in private as he has been in public for the over 20 years that he's been broadcasting here in New York. Let's go to Fran from Vineland. Good morning, Fran. Good morning. Good to see, hear your uh, voice again, uh, Curtis. I was very disappointed when you got taken off a long time ago, about a year ago or so. Oh, well, it's back. I'm back, and it's good to be back home here at WABC. Good to have you. I don't know your ideology. I think you, you, you go either way, but I, I want, want you to know that I'm very we were... Our whole family, most of my friends down here, were very, very, very strong Christy Whitman supporters uh, all through the election, even against Bradley. Yes. And very bright. She articulated well. And she was not a show lady. She was just uh, very good. Yes. Uh, this is shocking. And it, you know what it does? It, it, there's a syndrome in the Republican Party, especially if you're a conservative. You know you've got the media against you, number one. Yes. You're just a dispassionate fellow. You're no good. But number two, if the Republicans who have the ideas, for some reason or other, they try to satisfy the liberal crocodiles. They try to throw them a bone here and there so that they want to prove that they're really not such bad people. And this is the worst thing that they can do. It, it certainly lacks principle. Christie came out. Now, whether you were pro-choice or not, okay, and I say pro-abortion, she has no right to say to the rest of the Republican people in the country, uh, the Republican Party ought to go to pro-choice. They ought to stick to their guns like Reagan did. Stick, even if you are proven wrong or people vote against you, stick to your guns. We've had too many Republican candidates trying to please the liberal media because they know the odds are stacked against them. Oh, in fact, if I can make mention, uh, Frank, is it? Frank. Oh, Frank, okay. If Frank. I can make mention... Other broadcasters have come under fire before. We remember Howard Stern, his battles with the FCC. But wasn't it Senator Al D'Amato, the Republican conservative senator of New York, who took to the floor of the Senate in a passionate display of support for Howard Stern's First Amendment rights? I don't see that taking place now for Bob Grant when he's under attack. Don Imus, who has been labeled a bigot and an anti-Semite on prior occasions, actually referred to Christine Todd Whitman during the uh, campaign as prostituting herself, and yet Christine Todd Whitman will appear with him now anytime, any place that she desires. Yet notice, why Bob Grant? Because well, out of all of them, who can deliver a vote? Well, let me, uh, I, I agree with you. In fact, I was on with Bob about, oh, ten months ago, because uh, calling from here, we're over 120 miles away. Yes. And I said that I thought of all the, the factors that she got elected, he was mostly responsible. And I'm going to tell you something. Bob Grant, Rush Limbaugh, the only reason they're attacked falsely is because they do have the ideas that have been so absent throughout the country, throughout the media. We've had a one-party ideology and a one-party press in this country, and they're afraid. See, they always talk about the right of the First Amendment, except when you disagree with them. Yes, yes. And, that, and you know, Curtis, every time I used to hear you and, and Lisa get into it once in a while... 
And you were always, when you took a conservative viewpoint, you were dispassionate. You didn't make people feel good, regardless of how right you were. Well, that's why it's important, friend, that uh, we all understand that uh, if we're going to be fair towards all broadcasters, we not allow anyone to be separated from the pack and attacked and gored. Uh, because that potentially can affect all of us. It's either we all get disciplined or none of us get disciplined. Let's go to uh, Loretta from Teaneck. Good morning, Loretta. Good morning, Curtis. Uh, I, you ended the 10 o'clock hour with a statement, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Yes. I find this very curious that Bob Grant spends uh, some four hours a day, five days a week, attacking people in politics. Now, I happen to be a Democrat. Yes. I happen to also be in politics, by the way, yes, so that you know my bias. He spends four hours a day, 20 hours a week attacking people. He has, I haven't read the New York Magazine article, so I don't know what it says. Okay. But uh, he gets one article against him in one magazine, and one person, the governor of the state of New Jersey, says she won't appear with him again. And for some reason, the whole world is coming to an end. There needs to be a circling of the wagons. Nobody's taking Bob Grant's First Amendment rights away. As a matter of fact, I think this has probably helped his listenership. I wouldn't have been listening to this program today if it hadn't been for this bit of a, of a furor over oh, this inter uh, interesting point. Uh, statement, because I don't usually listen to the seven hours of the liberal media, quote-unquote, in the form of Rush Limbaugh and Bob Grant, who I believe they have a right to their views on uh, the various subjects facing the American people today. However, the manner in which they put it, the words they use, those are the words that incite ill feelings. And I think that their vocabulary could be straightened out a bit. Hmm. All right. Well, excellent point. Well taken. Thank you very much, Loretta. Thank you. Appreciate the call. And Loretta, I'm sure, like many others, tuning in uh, to the active-minded part of the dial because of this controversy and many others that have come before. That's the whole nature of talk radio. You air it out. And when we come back, Roy Ennis has arrived, chairman of CORE, a uh, man who, over the years, has been provided a forum on the Bob Grand Show, and we'll tap into his feelings about this brewing controversy. The new MetroCard in 69 subway stations already and being used by thousands of people every day. What convinced them to give it a try? Let's find out. I'm actually just using my MetroCard for the first time. I bought it last week. I just was going to buy tokens one day and decided to get the MetroCard. You know, you Quick, easy, saves time. Time is money in New York City. It's great to have. I just take it out of my wallet, swipe it through the machine and walk through. And I just keep track. I look at the machine so I can see that I have more rides left. It's very convenient. What if I told you next year MetroCard is coming to buses and a lot more subway stations? I'd say it's definitely going to become mainstream and might as well get on the boat early. I mean, it's going to be the wave of the future. The new MetroCard. It's easy to use, convenient to carry, and you can buy it in multiples of $5 up to $80. So there's less waiting, more and more. Moving. Having a Metro card is like having a token booth in my pocket. But probably a lot more comfortable, right? Metro card, making life in New York a little easier. From the Metropolitan Transportation Authority, going your way. This message was paid for by friends of Mario Cuomo. This is Ed Koch, the voice of reason. People say Mario Cuomo has been there a long time, but that's what they said about me. Can you believe it? I've run against Mario Cuomo twice. I beat him in 77 for mayor. He beat me in 82 for governor. I believe we both have done a good job in our positions. I'm for Mario Cuomo. I believe he's done a good job over the last 12 years. I believe he will do an even better job over the next four years. He can be better than the last 12. I could have been better too. And I believe that he's far better than any of the candidates who are uh, running, and that's why I'm supporting him. Mario Cuomo doesn't have my sweet disposition. Who does? And we don't agree on everything. Who does? Mario Cuomo is honest, he knows the ropes, and he'll fight like hell for New York, and that's why I'm supporting him. I know him, I've run against him, I'm for him, and you should be too. It's 1132 of the Ed Koch Show. I'm Curtis Slewa. And I want to tell you about an amazing new discovery, Breath Assure, the internal breath freshener that you swallow. They have tiny capsules containing a unique blend of parsley seed and sunflower oils and clinically tested and proven to work. Breath Assure helps stop bad breath and gives you natural, clean breath. You can eat what you want and not worry about offensive bad breath. Breath Assure gets rid of garlic breath, onion breath, even morning breath. Breath Assure is 100% natural, and because it's not a candy, gum, or mint, there's no minty mask. Just clean breath. That lasts and lasts 
only nineteen ninety five for four packs of Breath Assure. That's two hundred Breath Assure capsules for only nineteen ninety five plus shipping and handling. Call toll free this number one eight hundred eight four seven four four zero zero. That's one eight hundred eight four seven four four zero zero. Breath Assure is now available at AMP Wall Bombs and other fine stores. And we're now joined, as promised, uh, by two gentlemen, Roy Innes, chairman uh, of the Congress of Racial Equality, and his son, Niger Innes, both of whom have appeared here on WABC, and particularly you, Roy, over the years, who I know, and having been an avid listener, has been provided a forum on the Bob Grant Show over a number of issues that I never got to hear during the other attention that mainstream uh, media would be uh, giving at that particular time to issues other than yours. Well, you're so right, Curtis. I think a critical problem we face in this country is uh, a media blockout of certain kinds of people who express uh, different points of view. I mean, there is an invidious, a vicious, invidious censorship that uh, goes on, and especially in New York City. Uh, it was a time that I could not be heard unless it was uh, on the Bob Grant show or uh, Barry Faber or you, Curtis. Mm -hmm. I mean, you guys were the ones that allowed my voice to be heard by the public. And, and I'm, I'm told this all the time by the public. Often people will say, I haven't heard from you. I haven't seen you on television recently. I've not seen you in the paper. Except on the Bob Grant show or the Barry Faber show or your show previously when you had it. Or even when you went to NYC. Yes. Uh, and it's, 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 I believe that if we really dig to the bottom of this so-called Bob Grant crisis, you'll find that the anti-Grant people are really angry with him, not so much for what he says, but because he has given voice to certain kinds of people in the black community, such as the Roy Innesses, the Myrtle Whitmores, the Tom Sewells, the Walter Williams, the Joe Clarks. I mean, these are voices that you do not hear often. Uh, you do not hear them the way you hear the Jesse Jacksons, the, the Al Sharptons, the, the Vernon Masons, and, and, and such. Voices, you know, the, 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 these are the voices. The, the Sharptons, the Masons have regular uh, outlets and uh, radio station racism, WLIB, and even the, 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 the other one, uh, RL. Uh, but in a more Whitmore, Sewell, Williams, Clark, people like that, and so many others, eloquent spokesmen, you know, equally eloquent opposing point of view, are snuffed out, are censored. Mm -hmm. And it is the fact that Bob has been the chief agent to break that censorship, why he's under attack mm -hmm. in, in the New York Magazine, and now in this most, most recent thing here with, uh, with uh, Governor Whitman. Now, uh, part of my interest in listening to Bob Grant over the years has been uh, when he has used his bully pulpit to rally around the victims of crime who fought back. Yes. Uh, everyone knows the Bernard Getz case yes. because it had international attention. But I can remember cases involving sometimes Well, let me give you two, two of my clients. Yes. Austin Weeks, the so-called black Bernie Getz. The fact is Austin Weeks. Uh, did his subway number defending himself and defending ladies in that train against white hoodlums. Um, his hoodlums were shot dead as against Bernie Guess, whose hoodlum lived to commit other crimes in the black community. And everyone knew about the Bernard Guest situation. Very few people know about Austin Weeks. Well, in fact, I first heard about it on the Bob Grant show. Exactly. Then I can remember Lady Getz. Yes, a young black lady. Uh, on the way uh, from, from, from work, who was attacked uh, with her girlfriend by some hoodlums, uh, trying to hijack her car, and shot her, her friend, uh, her girlfriend, dead. And uh, Lady Getz, Yvonne Bureau, was able to get to a little, uh, little 25 pistol and, uh, and shot one of the hoodlums, uh. who then exited the car uh, and... Uh, tried to run them down, went to the hospital, and was finally caught. Uh, Bob Grant, again, was one of the few people that give full earring to that crisis. Again, you know, the, the liberal media, the one-sided media, did not pick up 
and the similarity between the uh, the activities and the, the, the constitutional right exhibited by uh, Yvonne Bureau yes. uh, and, and by Austin Weeks. To contrast that with the equally legitimate activities of Bernard Getz. Yes. Only the Bob Grant show. If I can, I'd like to ask Niger, your son, who comes now from a different mold. Unlike yourself and myself, Roy, who grew up with Bob Grant, we've heard him over the years. Niger and his peers have grown up in the era of, like, the Howard Stern. I the thought Don you Ives were types. in Niger's generation, Curtis. Well, <laughs> I wish. <laughs> but anyway, Niger, in, in having followed the course of talk radio and all the controversies that have emerged about First Amendment rights and free speech and the way people are analyzed. How do you and your peer group see this, uh, this emerging uh, questioning of a person's uh, background, integrity, whether they're racist or non-racist based on, on the opinions that they give over the airwaves? Well, I find a growing political correctness, not only uh, in terms of criticism of media, but in academia and in any field of intelligent thought. If you're not pegged, if you're not labeled, if you're not, uh, if you don't give the party line, then you're going to be criticized by certain elements. You know, I, I ask uh, the younger listeners out there, uh, let's assume that Bob Grant's critics are right. Let's take that for granted. Let's say that Bob Grant is, is a bigot against criminals, is a bigot against hoodlums, is a bigot against those who undermine the values uh, in, in our society. Is that bigotry more dangerous than the Nina Totenbergs and the Jack Newfields who assume that blacks should all uh, think alike? Is that racism more dangerous than the liberal press and the liberal media uh, attack on Roy Ennis, on Thomas Sowell, on Walter Williams, on Clarence Thomas? I mean, which bigotry is more dangerous to the black community. I think that's how uh, my generation feels. Let, let, me, let me say this also, uh, Curtis, because I heard Al uh, driving here. Al from East Orange. Al from East Orange saying that Bob had, uh, un had been unprovoked and had told him to come down to the studio and shine his shoes. Well, I remember that. I remember hearing that. And I got to tell you that Al is a fake phony fraud because Al had called Bob Grant a cracker. <laughs> and I remember that, uh, that particular show. And Al had said that, Bob, you're nothing more than a cracker. Mm. And Bob responded now, in God. Isn't it interesting that a congressman, Charlie Rangel, in the heat of the last mayoral uh, race between Rudy Giuliani and Mayor Dinkins, used that same term to refer to Mayor Giuliani and his supporters as a group of crackers. Yes. And yet he still strides in the halls of Congress. And people are throwing out these words that, let's face it, years ago, when we were all little ones growing up, our mothers may have taken the uh, brown soap, the naphtha soap, and washed our mouths out. But it's an age in which people are expressing themselves in a different way than we ever did around well, the dinner the, table. The worst, the worst part of this is that only certain kinds of people are allowed to express themselves. Uh. In other words, it's all right for that, that bunch over at the uh, LIB to call anyone who opposed their view, who did differ with any name, may they be black uh, or white. But it's not all right for Bob Grant to respond in kind. Yes. Uh, for, Bob Grant, Bob to, for Bob to criticize a Martin Luther King becomes racism. When in fact, I can show you criticism of King by Malcolm X. Hmm. I can show criticism of King by James Farmer, who used to head core. By John Lewis, who uh, is, is a congressman now. In other words, there used to be a time when black leaders and other people could critique. I mean, black leaders aren't made of... Of, uh, of glass. We, we're not brittle. Right? Uh, and none of us are saints that cannot be criticized. That's, it, it, it is it's patronizing. It, it, it is insulting to the humanity of black folks to say that to criticize any one particular black person is to attack all black people. Hmm. Right? And what, what, what bothers me so much is that this kind of automatic defense of blackness around a critique of King is the same kind of defense around a common street criminal. You criticize a bunch of hoodlums in Central Park who rapes a jogger, you become a racist. You know, at the same breath, the same people will have the same defense as Dr. King. What are the same about Dr. King and these hoodlums? Yes, yes. Yeah. All right, when we come back, we're going to have to go to the phone lines. There are many people who have been on wait. Although I've, I've never voted Republican, but I think I will for the next gubernatorial race. But true conservative people believe in the Constitution fully and wholly. And when you have a discussion about a particular person, getting away from the Constitution, when you have a discussion about a particular person and their politics, when you try to evade the issue, Curtis, by saying, well, what about Sharpton? 
well, what about this person? Well, what about that person? You're not addressing whether that person, that topic is right or wrong. And that's what you did to that first caller today who made some very salient points about your Mr. Bob Grant. Well, you know, it's interesting, uh, the point you make, Arthur, uh, in that even if my two guests represented only a 3 to 10% portion of the black community. You are denying them a voice. Of course. That is not true here at WABC. We've had the most <laughs> radicalized voices That's appear right. here. You, you know, Curtis is interested. We've had the most radicalized voices on the air. That's true. There is not real discussion of real issues. Roy Ennis and his son are fools. They're, they're silly. They, they, they are not intelligent men, and they don't speak intelligently about issues. They, they do what is often done by conservatives when asked a tough question. A including you, since you're conservative, <laughs> Arthur? <laughs> I, 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 I should say, let's call, let's call, let's call a spade a spade, and, and you are reactionaries, not conservatives. That's I what see. you are. Arthur, I rest my case around your analysis. You I mean, your analysis you, you, proves you the point. You should. You certainly should. Very good. I think the listening audience understands clearly... What I'm talking about when I say invi vicious, invidious censorship and the intellectual reign of terror. Wow, you yeah. know, and, and, and he was so confident in saying that, yes. Nigel, that yeah. because you might represent 10% of the black population. You can't be heard. Wow. And Is he's, that... he's for the Constitution. Yeah. Except he forgot the First Amendment. <laughs> so without a WABC as an outlet for many black co real conservatives, mm. you would have no voice at all. Exactly. That's right. Like I said, I could rest my whole case around that fella. He has proven everything I've said here today. You know, Curtis, Clarence Thomas said a very interesting thing. He said, you know, it's funny that it's considered racist for people to say that all blacks look alike, but it's not considered racist to believe that all blacks think alike. Mm. And on that point, let's take a brief break. Yeah, it we'll... was soft. It was, it was written by a guy who had gone to college with uh, Conrad Muhammad, and it was very sympathetic. I mean, the, the, the perception that you had in seeing the two New York covers were, was that it was going to be balanced uh, stories. But the attack on Bob Grant was scurrilous, and the uh, coverage on Conrad Muhammad and the Nation of Islam was soft, as soft as usual. You know, you know Niger, it reminds me of what people are trying to do with Ali North and Marion Berry in, in the Washington, D.C. area. Hey, Ali North, whatever crimes he may have committed, he did it for patriotic reasons against Marion Barry caught with a quasi-prostitute in a hotel smoking crack mm. in drug-infested Washington, D.C., and people want to equate both of those guys? I'll tell you. Well, I'm not going to duck this issue. I don't think any of my colleagues should. It affects uh, our bread and butter on our table. C Curtis, let me tell you. Yes. I challenge any of your listeners who are on, in this anti-Bob Grant mode, show me any black person who has been criticized as hard as Bob has criticized Mario Cuomo and Jim Florio. Slim Flam Florio. Both That's are Italian. <laughs> Bob is an Italian. <laughs> Piano recital? What are you doing? Nah, just doing that. That's that Rocky theme. You came out swinging. We may lose in the end, but you go 15 rounds, Bob. And uh, we're not losing in the end. I'm not losing anything. I mean, our court. I'm not, I'm not running for election. Rudy and Cur and Christy Whitman. We're like Republicans are in a boat rowing in different directions, while the Democrats just keep rolling along. Anyway, let me just finish up. I wrote a song for that famous. Well, I, I would hope you'd get to the doggone song for heaven's sake. <laughs> I just upset Because we don't have that kind of time. Please get to the song, please. When Governor Whitman needed a friend, we said we'd be there through thick and thin. And Bob put himself out because he is our champ. That's why the lady, she's a tramp. There it is. I want to take this opportunity to thank you and to thank your listeners for their support because I got a great deal of support from you and it, meant it, it made a big difference. A lot of people came up to me and said, I heard you on Bob Grant and they heard you talking about me and I really appreciate it and your listening audience as well for their support. All right, that says it all, right, Marty? Hello, Al. Yes, hello, Mr. Grant. Uh, yes, sir. We're standing what goes on in Mr. Giuliani's jelly brain. I'm a little confused and I would like your opinion on two things. Yes. Uh, such as... Whose vote does he think he's going to swing or capture? And uh, 
Will he ever run on the Republican ticket, and whose vote could he ever ask for again that he got before? Well, I don't think he intends to ever rep uh, run on the Republican ticket, unless it's in a Republican primary. If he seeks re-election in yeah, 1997, well, he, would get beat. Uh, he may uh, try that, and then I think what will happen to him would be the same thing that happened to John Lindsay when mm -hmm. he did that right. in uh, 1969. If you recall, John Lindsay mm -hmm. was elected on the Republican and liberal lines in 1965. Mm -hmm. Then in 1969, uh, he was defeated by John Markey in the Republican primary, but he ran uh, solely on the liberal line and won. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, after being rejected by his own party, after he has turned his back on his own party, uh, then he uh, became a Democrat. But notice his... Um, his political career ended at that point, and I think that uh, that's what would happen to uh, Rudy. Well, more important, whose vote is he going to capture now? Well, he... Who is he going to... Oh, you mean in the... In, committed one way or the other. You mean, in the swing? you mean in the gubernatorial election? Yeah. I don't think his endorsement will prove... Uh, will prove to be a factor in the re-election of Mario Cuomo. If anything... If anything, it could backfire. It could backfire, yes. But I don't think when we look back after November 8th and uh, reassess uh, the uh, election, I don't think we'll find that the Giuliani endorsement was a major factor in electing not. Cuomo if he wins. But uh, there are still many, many people who think that um, George Pataki is going to win nevertheless, not in spite of in some cases, but because of the Rudy endorsement of, uh, of Mario Cuomo. I certainly hope so, because that, may I make a comment, uh, on, on character being the issue. Yes. Uh, I chastised and even reported to you uh, when Mr. Koch uh, demeaned Giuliani's character the first time he ran against Dinkins. Yeah. Now I'm sure he'll praise him for his sterling character in supporting Cuomo. And what is, on your mind... This afternoon, huh? Well, I would be less than honest if I told you that I had uh, the Middle East on my mind or uh, GATT on my mind or even the election in California on my mind, although that is extremely important. Even the Svachim is not that important today. Well, they're all important, but uh, you know what's on my mind. And so many of you, when I ask what's on your mind, you call in and you want to know what's on my mind. Well, what's on my mind is why in the world Frank Loudenberg would be so desperate to keep his seat in the United States Senate that he would try to smear Chuck Atayan by smearing me. And I think this explains why Frank Loudenberg is acting the way he's acting. From Associated Press, Trenton. The Star Ledger, Eagleton Poll, released today. That was yesterday, the 23rd. Shows the Republican candidate Chuck Hattayan cutting into the Democrat incumbent Frank Lautenberg's lead in the United States Senate race. And that explains it. Um, look. I plead guilty, I plead guilty to being as self-centered as the next guy. I plead guilty to having uh, an ego. I plead guilty to liking to think that I'm important. But in spite of all the admissions of guilt you have just heard, I can't believe that I loom as the transcending issue in the final stages of the senatorial campaign. I cannot believe that. And yet again, having been a student of politics all my life, I, um, I should know better that when it comes to elections, campaign managers and candidates themselves can make tragic missteps, tragic for their own candidacy, by virtue of getting hysterical, and that's what has happened to Frank Lautenberg. Now, everybody's asking me, where does Chuck stand? Where does Chuck stand? I can't speak for Chuck Italian. I can only speak for myself. But I can tell you, without betraying any confidence, that in many conversations over the weekend, including one even this morning, uh, with the speaker, he has told me he's not deserting me, 
for one very simple reason. There's no reason to desert me. Now, as far as the governor of the state of New Jersey is concerned, there have been many reports as to where she stands. Some people now say she is waffling from her Sherman-esque uh, statement of Friday. And uh, I don't want to misquote the governor, so let me peruse the New Jersey line, the Associated Press. Here it is. Noted radio personality reference. Noted radio... Per oh, that's me. Noted radio personality reference. Trenton. Governor Whitman stands by her decision to no longer appear on a radio talk show. Whitman would consider going on with Bob Grant if the host wants to talk about racism and how it relates to his comments. That might not be a bad idea. Governor, you have never hesitated in the past to call me when you were running against Bill Bradley for the Senate uh, in the aftermath of the Bill Bradley defeat, which you narrowly won. You have never hesitated calling me in that interim. You certainly didn't hesitate to call me many times in your primary campaign victory over Jim Walwork and uh, over my old friend who I haven't seen Carrie, Edward, Carrie Edwards in a long time. You never hesitated to call me to be on the program. And, of course, you never hesitated to call me in your come-from-behind victory over Flim Flam Florio. May I respectfully submit, therefore, Governor, that you follow a long-time practice and call me again and make arrangements for your appearance on this program. And I would be more than happy to accommodate you and the subject racism, and how it relates to my comments. Because, ladies and gentlemen, without trying to magnify this, without trying to make myself bigger than, than I really am, I think it's high time that we take stock of what we've been doing in this country. And what we have been doing in this country is putting ourselves into a straitjacket based on statements that could be misconstrued one way or the other, and the person who determines whether they are acceptable or not are persons that have not been empowered to speak for you or for me, but have appointed themselves. Now, having said that, as you know, the black ministers who met on uh, Friday in uh, Trenton were led by a very distinguished gentleman by the name of the Reverend Reginald T. Jackson. He is the pastor of the St. Matthew AME Church in Orange, New Jersey. And I happen to have high regard for Reverend Jackson. And I know how Reverend Jackson thinks, and I know that he is an eminently fair man. How do I know? I've interviewed him twice on the Bob Grant Show. He was on this program on the 10th of November, 1993, in the wake of the Ed Rollins scandal. And here is an excerpt of that conversation between Bob Grant and the Reverend Reginald Jackson. The uh, Reverend Reginald Jackson, ladies and gentlemen, of, uh, of St. Matthew's AME Church in Orange, New Jersey, is at the other end of the line. The uh, Reverend is a Florio supporter. Uh, you say, Reverend, that what uh, Ed Rollins was talking about never happened. Is that right, sir? Uh, I take him at his word that it didn't happen. Uh, there is uh, much uh, speculation that uh, people in your community... Uh, people like yourself uh, are offended at the suggestion uh, that uh, people could be bought off. Uh, uh, how deep is that feeling in uh, in your uh, church, and uh, how do you personally feel about it? Well, I think there's always a possibility in an organiz any organization that some people could be bought off, but the mass uh, buying out of the numbers of which they would talk about for this election uh, is extremely unlikely, half a million dollars. Uh, and the number of votes you're talking about, that's an awful lot of people. 
You know, it, it certainly is to your credit that you are <clears throat> coming out and making this statement, although some people might say, well, he, he didn't have to say anything, but uh, being a man of the cloth and uh, being a man of integrity, uh, you feel that uh, you have to come forward and uh, tell the truth. Well, the election's over. Um, I think Mrs. Whitman is trying to put together her administration and the Black Minister's Council intends to work with her. It's in our best interest that uh, she's a good governor. All right, that's a portion of the interview uh, that uh, we had with the uh, Reverend on the 10th of November. And uh, then we did uh, a subsequent interview with him on the 1st of December. And uh, I think uh, we are prepared to hear a little bit of, of that. Excuse me, it was not December 12th, it was January 12th, 1994. Again, with the Reverend Reginald T. Jackson. We're on the newsbreaker line, as we uh, promised you we would be, with Reverend Reginald Jackson, pastor of the St. Matthew's AME Church in Orange, New Jersey. And you may recall, the Reverend is also the chairman of the Black Ministers' Council of New Jersey's Political Action Committee. Uh, we talked to him a few weeks ago. Uh, Reverend, you say you're not surprised by the U.S. Attorney's decision today, dropping the probe into alleged voter fraud in last year's gubernatorial election. No, I'm not surprised. I uh, never believed that any money was distributed among uh, black clergy around the state. Well, as a matter of fact, I do recall in uh, our interviews in the past, back there in November, uh, you said the same thing then. So uh, <laughs> your record is very clear here that uh, you were not taken in by this. No, I uh, believe it was Mr. Rollins trying to get one up to ship on Mr. Carville, and unfortunately his um, effort to inflate his own uh, position really caused a lot of unnecessary pain in the black community. It's really put uh, Mrs. Whitman's administration or transition behind. Uh, it's really been a lot of waste of energy, money, and effort. All right, so as you can hear, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, Reverend Jackson is a fair person and uh, indeed uh, is a man of integrity, and I don't for one minute think that there's any malice on his part in uh, the statement that he read on the steps of the state capitol on Friday. I think he is acting in good faith. I do believe, however, that he uh, is misinterpreting. I do believe, however, he has been misinformed. And I do believe that the same Bob Grant that he talked to then on uh, several occasions uh, is one that uh, he could feel confident about, but uh, I cannot uh, speak for him. I can only tell you my perceptions of the Reverend Jackson. As far as uh, Governor Whitman is concerned, uh, again, if she wishes to uh, amend her statement, and apparently she has amended her statement, she would be wishes to uh, contact us. Certainly, that might be a very instructive thing for everybody to have an open discussion. You know, nothing behind closed doors, but an open discussion on the subject in which she stated. So, Governor, if you meant what you said, please contact the office. You know the number by heart, I'll bet. Now, before I do anything else, I would be remiss if I didn't thank some of my colleagues who have been so supportive at this time. First of all, Curtis Lewa was absolutely magnificent today when he filled in for Dennis at 10 o'clock. It was one of the most magnificent extemporaneous uh, addresses I've ever heard on any radio station anywhere. And um, it was a magnificent program that he conducted with Roy Innes and Joe Clark and, of course, my old very dear friend Myrtle Whitmore and several other members of the black community. Um, I was touched by what they all said. And uh, Roy Innes' son, Niger, what a fine young man, and I thank Niger for his comments. And over the weekend, of course, on Friday night, Jay Diamond... And uh, Lynn Samuels. And you know something about Lynn? I've said to people, I've said, listen, forget about the political rhetoric. Forget about all that. As a person, I have to like Lynn. I've liked her. And some people say, ah, I don't want you to like her. Well, that's too bad. I've liked her. 
And when I heard how magnificent she was over the weekend in, uh, in her loyalty to me, I, uh, I think some of you know now why I feel that way. So let's put uh, political dichotomies aside for a moment and talk about the person. And so, Lynn, in addition to Jay and Curtis, I thank you, the three of you, uh, have been outstanding, and I will never forget, I will never forget you. There are others on this radio station who uh, um, can only speak for themselves, and uh, I wouldn't uh, pretend to even attempt to speak for them. It wouldn't be fair of me. Uh, New York City, hello, Larry. Hi, Mr. Grant. Uh, I, b- beyond the, the incredible thing that uh, Mrs. Whitman did to you last week, the betrayal of a, of a close friend, which is a, a terrible thing to do. I, I wanted to comment on what I think is the larger political meaning of this, because it's what she did to you is almost symbolic of what's happening to the entire country. Uh, these, you know, r- Republicans or so-called conservatives, as long as they share the basic premises of liberalism and egalitarianism, they will end up betraying people like you, in the end, in order to appease the minorities. And uh, I think it's a great lesson for all of us to recognize reality, that ultimately people like Mrs. Whitman, who are fine people, they are ultimately on the other side. Hmm. Uh, I'm afraid that uh, you've made a correct observation, all too true, in this politically correct year of 1994. Thank you, Larry. Okay, thank you. And WABC, Joe. Hello, what's on your mind, Joe? Yes, good afternoon, Bob. I'm kind of, I would like to make a comment, if I could, number one, on this Cuomo thing, you know, running for re-election and whatever. I guess you're aware that whatever money he gets or is left over from his hope chest goes in his own pocket as okayed by law. Yes, yes. Okay, and whatever that's worth. I was just kind of wondering why everybody else is distancing themselves from Clinton with the exception of him. That's number one. And number two, the one question I would like to ask, because I am a Republican conservative, for whatever it's worth, I would like to know what your opinion is on the fact that uh, there is a good possibility that we can kind of turn things around now in, in Republican Congress and so on and so forth. In New York, we have had a Republican majority for some time. Have we not? Am I correct on that assumption? What do you mean by Republican majority? Uh, as far as, uh, I guess, the either the, the Senate or the Assembly goes, I'm not too sure which. Well, the Senate uh, has had a Republican majority. Okay. The uh, Assembly, however, has had a very lopsided Democrat majority. Okay. Now, I was just kind of curious because I would like to see Republican Congress in, in Washington as well as as well as the Senate. I just want to make sure it's the, it's the right way to go, so to speak, because we have had one here. I wasn't aware that we had only one of the two. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Uh, James, you're on WABC. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, Bob. The Oscar goes to Governor Christine Todd Whitman for her imitation of Claude Rains in the great film Casablanca. (laughs) You know, everybody remembers Claude Rains as the prefect of police who regularly frequented Rick's Cafe, and during an act of patriotism that took place in Rick's Cafe, Major Henry Strasso went up to Claude Rains and said, this establishment must be closed immediately. Whereupon Claude Rains blew his whistle, got the attention of the patrons and said, by order of the prefect of police, this establishment is closed immediately. And Humphrey Bogart asked why. And he said, because I'm shocked, shocked to find that there's gambling going on on the premises. Just then the croupier comes up and hands Claude Rains his winnings. And Claude says, thank you very much. Well, Christine Todd Whitman did just the same thing. By being pressured by the Afro-Nazis, with the exception of the minister you mentioned, to me, most of these individuals are Afro-Nazis hiding under the robes of ministers. They put the fix in last year, when along with the NAACP, they were demanding that she not take the oath of office until they could give the proper clearance. So what does Christy Whitman do? On Friday, in a figurative way of speaking, she says, I'm shocked, shocked to find that there are very important social, economic, political, and racial truths being spoken on this man's show. Thank you. Uh, When you you make that statement. Well, uh, what what do you think I mean? I don't know, because like Christians, um, my... Well, what do you mean you don't? What what do you mean? Well, in terms of, I'm trying to get what your definition definition is. The reason why I ask is because my uh, grandmother, well, my whole side of my uh, mother's side of the family is German, and my father's side of the family is primarily Austrian. 
is and primarily is what? Austrian. Well, uh, and, then, and, uh, uh, then you... Go on. Uh, there's nothing complicated here. Uh, they're from Europe, Heather? Are they really? Yes, they are. They really are? Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't believe you, Heather. But why do you not believe me? Well, you just uh, don't sound like uh, like that's the case. I'm sorry, Heather. I, I have to I be honest with you. I can assure you. I can assure you. You can even ask the gentleman that screens your phone calls before you Well, how would me. he know? He doesn't know you. I even offer What's your mother's maiden name? My mother's maiden name is Jackson, J-A-C-K-S-O-N. Jackson. And that's yes, Austrian, huh? No, uh. that's not. I'm saying on my father's side of the family and my mother's side of the family. Mm -hmm. I think this is a provocative call. It's I think not it's a provocative call yes, it is. at all. Uh, uh, look, if you're, if you're, if you have even a smidgen of intelligence, you know what white means. Well, it's not a matter of a smidgen of, of an intelligence. No, it's I'm not going to waste my time with you. How ridiculous. Uh, David, you're on WABC. Ladies and gentlemen, David from Irvington. Yes, good afternoon, Bob. Uh, Bob, I don't have to tell you. I'm sure you know that I stand with you all the way in this matter. Um, I'm very disappointed um, with uh, Governor Whitman. I believe that she's a very decent, good-hearted human being. Uh, I voted for her, um, and I still support her policies. I think she's she's doing a real good job uh, for the state of Jersey. And I think that um, some very decent people, you know, are misinformed. Um, see, the, the definition of racism has gotten so muddled and so distorted uh, a racist is a person who's motivated by blind hate. And I've listened to you long enough. I've spoken with you long enough to know that you are not motivated by blind hate. Um, a criminal is a criminal is a criminal. A bad person is a bad person is a bad person, regardless to what their skin pigmentation happens to be. And you've always been fair-minded in that regard. And, and I join um, my colleague Roy Ennis, and uh, Myrtle Whitmore, Joe Clark, and all of the uh, blacks whom you have been gracious to over the years. Uh, because if it had not been for your program and uh, Jay Diamond and a couple other media outlets, uh, voices like ours uh, would not be heard because uh, the left-wing media uh, does not uh, um, take, they don't have the interest uh, in putting on alternative voices coming from the black community. Uh, it serves their purpose to only pander to uh, the hate mongers, the Sharptons, the Farrakhans, and the uh, Conrad Muhammads, uh, because they have a love affair with extremism. And um, well, know, David, I appreciate what you're saying, and um, I think... Uh, uh, I sense the genuine disappointment you have in the governor, which, of course, uh, mirrors my genuine disappointment. And uh, that's, uh, that's what hurts. Uh, you know, if it's somebody you don't care about, no matter what they say, it's not going to hurt. But if it's somebody you do care about, and I've cared about the governor, yes, it does hurt. David, you're, you're a great guy, and I, I thank you very much. By the way, you mentioned uh, our good friend, uh, Big Al, the Reverend Al. Yes. Guess what? He's got a 40th birthday coming up. Are you going to be at the big celebration? <laughs> no, they're advertising it on your favorite radio station. <laughs> yeah, they've been... Well, really we ought to go together, you know? We ought to go together and pay our respects. 40th birthday seems... You know, he, he must have started when he was 15. Come to think about it, he did. Thank you very much, David. <laughs> okay. All right, on WABC, let's say hello to uh, you, Nick, uh, from uh, Dumont, uh, New Jersey. Yes, hello, Nick. Bob, the reason I called is to let you know that my wife and I canceled... Our subscription to the record, and I'll tell you why. In Saturday's record, the Bergen record, they had an article about you, but they printed it in such, they wrote it in such a way as to put you in a negative light. They had a picture of you with your eyes closed, and then the headline read, Racial Slurs Spur Whitman to Boycott Grant Radio Show. And if you read the article, I don't know whether you saw it in Saturday's record. I did. But, you, oh, you did? Yes. Well, you could see that the, the, this record, the Bergen record, which we will not even buy on a newsstand now, huh. is, is ready to endorse uh, Lornberg. You can, you can pretty well sense it, that they're ready to... to be, and the reason, I think, is also the, the, the fact that they've uh, uh, put in a, uh, a cartoon which, uh, which, which was uh, denigrating to uh, Chuck Atayan. And, uh, yeah, they are supporting, they are supporting uh, Lautenberg. That's like saying uh, 
that uh, the uh, sun comes up in the morning. I mean, there's not, you yeah. know, that's not news, certainly. Uh, but you're right, they did uh, portray it in a most unfair way, but uh, some of the other newspapers, uh, much to my pleasant surprise, I thought have been, have been fair. Uh, I'll tell you, about the fairest reportage was from the New York Times on Saturday. Mm-hmm. Very fair. I can't uh, quarrel with, uh, with anything they did on Saturday. Thank you very much, Wait, Nick. Uh, uh, Bob, can yes. I give the Mario salute, please? Sure. Mario, assenta me to say no Thanks, Bob. Uh, I want you to know that I clipped the last part of that. He had to add on some words that have no, really no place in the thing. He had to add on some words. I think I clipped it. I did clip it. Right. Okay, they, you know, they never let well enough alone, these people. Uh, Sam, you're on WABC. Hello. Bob Grant. Sam, uh, I just wanted to say I really regret what has happened. Uh, uh, you have always spoken out, and people always knew where you stood, and I think that that is to your credit, and no one can take that away from you. You and I have disagreed many times on, on certain issues, but that's, uh, that's fair, and that's, uh, that's the game of life. I just want to say that I do deeply regret, and I think it was an unfair uh, uh, thing to do. I hope that she will come to her senses and mend her ways with you. What disturbs me deeply, however, is the hypocrite Lautenberg uh, taking advantage of it. I just wanted to say, where was this hypocrite when when, uh, white students were being attacked at places like Kane College? Uh, Where was he uh, hiding in his office in Washington and not speaking up uh, for what was being done uh, at Kane College? Uh, the, I mean, the, uh, the hypocrisy on the part of this man is, is incredible and unbelievable. And for him to do and say what he said uh, is, uh, it just shows the kind of, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, well, he... Louses that we have uh, serving us in the, in the uh, Congress. I have been a Democrat for, many, uh, for most of my life, but I tell you, I'm so turned off on this bunch uh, that I seriously, you know, seriously consider... Uh, and I don't want to get into the political aspect of it, except that I'm just, I just hope that what we hear happening on a national level uh, happens and turns out some of these people who have been in so long that they have forgotten uh, what decency is all about. Thank you, Sam. I appreciate it, Bob. And, of course, the best uh, antidote to uh, what Frank Loudenberg has been orchestrating is uh, to defeat him at the polls, and that's what he's concerned about. That's why this attack on me. What a, Frank Lautenberg suddenly discovered Bob Grant after all these years. He suddenly discovered Bob. I've been calling him Lausenberg for years. All of a sudden, he discovered me? No, he's just using me to defeat Chuck Atayan. And uh, only you, the voters, only you, the voters on Election Day, can determine whether he succeeds or not. Did you listen? I'm just asking. I'm uh, Dorothy, I'm not addicted. Okay, okay. I'm not addicted to radio the okay. way you are. Apparently, okay. your whole life centers upon listening to the radio, and that's okay. No, okay, Bob. I want to give you some information since you didn't listen. Well, why did you have to ask me if I listened to Religion because on the Line? I mean, I mean couldn't sh- you tell me what you heard without asking whether... If I had said yes, then you'd say, okay, Bob. thank you, Bob. Bob, okay, kill me, okay? I just want to tell you that Rabbi Potashnik was on by himself, holding the fort, and he supported you all the way. He said that he knew you, he knew how you felt, you were no racist, maybe sometimes you were a little theatrical in in how you expressed yourself, but he supported you. After that, after he had his monologue, I got on, and after I discussed Israel, I supported you, and I said that it was blasphemous to have you in the same magazine with the Nation of Islam. Now, the result of my my call and what Potashnik had said was a caller got on and called Potashnik a racist, and of course she got me into the thing, and it, it ended up in a screaming meme between the rabbi and the caller. So I wanted you to know, because I heard you mention certain people that you, you felt were loyal to you and who supported you, and I hadn't heard you mention Potashnik, so I said, I've got to call him and tell him. That's number one. Are you with me, Bob? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, I think what's important, Bob, first of all, I got calls. I got calls from some of your listeners. Dorothy. How do they know how to get a hold of you? How uh, do they know your number? I don't even know your number. 
<laughs> no, seriously, I'm not being facetious. How, how is it they know how to call you and I don't? <laughs> Bob. Are you doing a radio show somewhere? I don't know. No, about. Bob, I, I support you all the way. But listen, even though you and I have had differences, and we have, there's, there were times when I was angry at you, but, but besides all that, you're a guy with a great deal of courage, a great deal of forgiveness, and, and, and look, the point I want to make is this, Bob. Who, were, who was this black group? that met with Governor Whitman and wanted her to condemn you like she had condemned the nation of Islam. Now, you know that there has been a, a, a black group that wanted to shut up the New York Post. They wanted to buy it up because they don't want to hear or read what the Post said. Yeah, now, Dorothy, take it easy now. Watch your blood pressure. Take it easy. Okay. Better? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Now, they also want to shut you up. Okay, and when the ADL had that large ad in the Times, which spelled out what the Nation of Islam, what Khalid Muhammad had said in the nation, from the Nation of Islam, how he attacked the Pope, how he told his listeners to kill the whites in South Africa, how he certainly attacked the Jews. Okay, they were mad at the ADL for revealing. What he said. They want us to shield them from the truth. I'm not going to shield them. And what worried me, Bob, was I put myself in your place. I have gone through an, uh, an incident where a person that I befriended and that I helped and that I went all out yeah. for, I felt had betrayed me. Uh -huh. And that's the worst sort of that's the worst sort of disillusionment because it's like at two brute. Right. You know. You are. Well. Okay. So, Bob. Yes. I, do me a favor. I'm a woman, and I think that I have an intuitive sense that many men may not have. Don't change. Not at all. Because before we even heard of, of Whitman, you had influence. You were respected as a talk show host. Most of your listeners and their legion agree with you, Bob. Don't change. Because they want you to change. Don't. That's Dorothy from Montclair. I thank you, Dorothy. Dorothy from Montclair, as only Dorothy from Montclair can present herself on WABC. First, let me just state that um, I live in Newark, Essex County. I've been working here. I've been on a Democratic committee. And just let you know that the, the reverends, the so-called men of cloth who are uh, against you, have always been and will always be in the Democrats' pockets. Uh, that's been a known thing here in Essex County. It's been going on for years. So when they come on TV and say you're a racist and you're this and that, it's just a political ploy from them to help the Democrats out, including Mr. Lausenberg. Uh, I just want to let you know that we uh, thank you for being on the air and opening our eyes and just being a part of uh, the everyday talk of America, because not for you, some of us who were led astray wouldn't understand what's really going on, and we appreciate it. Well, I thank you, sir. I thank you. Have a good day. Ken, you're on WABC. Hello. Hi, Bob. I called up the Governor Whitman's office today. Yes, and uh, I, they sort of didn't know what, what to do with me. I wanted to inquire about the government, the governor's uh, statement with respect to you. So they finally gave me a Ms. Lake, who was supposed to handle these sort of things. And I said, "Well, no, I've been listening to Bob for a number of years now, and I wonder what racist remarks he was alleged to have made." And she said, "Well, I'm uh, not prepared to uh, say what they were." I said, "Well, that's." Cu she said, well, "Let me read you the governor's statement." I said, "Well, I've already heard the governor's statement." So she proceeded to read it, and I said, "Well." The governor put this in the conditional, if he said these things. I said, what things was it possible he would have said that were racist? She said, well, we're not prepared to say that. I said, well, was anybody in that office prepared to say? She said, well, not at this time. I said, well, uh, you know, the only thing I've ever heard Bob say was if somebody was a rapist or a murderer or a rioter or something like that, that they were a savage. I said, whatever their color was. I said, now, wouldn't you say that rape, for example, is a savage act? And she said, I can't comment on that. I said, well, Ms. Lake, why can't you comment whether rape is a savage act? She said, because any statement I make might be misconstrued. Well, she was doing her job. No, I can't fault her. No, she's in a tough spot. No, really. But they never came up with... I, I, nobody in the whole governor's office in Trenton is able to come up with what alleged racist statement she was supposed to have made. Well, that's, that's why the governor is so off balance on this, because she realizes that the statement that Rita Mano composed for her, or Carl Golden... Uh, really is 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 uh, absurd uh, because uh, she says 
I never heard him say this, but if he is beginning to talk this way, I will not appear on his program again. And uh, she says, therefore, I will not appear on his program again. It's an unfortunate statement. Arbitron. Unfortunate for her. He's on the line. Hello. Hey, Glenn. Tony, yes. Good afternoon, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, you know that in the uh, gubernatorial election in uh, New Jersey, I did work very hard for Mr. Whitman. However, I would like to go on record and register my satisfaction with Governor Whitman for her refusal to appear in your program. To me, this action on her part is reprehensible. And I hope she reassess her sense of direction and refrain from that statement because I think Governor Woodman has been ill advised by some group of ministers who else knows. You know, three days prior to the election, I had the privilege of speaking to uh, Mrs. Woodman right here in the city of Elizabeth. And I indicated to her how much you have been contributing to her election. And she did recognize the cooperation that you was given her during the com uh, campaign. And I'm calling you to, uh, today, Bob, to reaffirm my conviction and my support to you and tell you that I'm behind you all the way. Keep up the good work. There's something else, uh, Bob. Yes, what is it, Tony? You're not a racist because you know mm -hmm. that I was born in Cuba. I have, a, I have accent, and you never close the door for me in your program. You're always available. Thank you very much, Bob. <laughs> Not at all. Thank you. Uh, a lot of uh, very decent, uh, fair-minded people in uh, this vast audience. And uh, some of them uh, have exhibited how fair-minded they are, even though they may uh, disagree with me, as well as those who do disagree. And I am uh, I'm touched by it. But again... I am not the issue. They're trying to hurt Chuck Atayan by attacking me. Keep our Arbitron's eye on the prize. Yes, I'm here, I'm I don't understand. Is there something wrong in the control? Uh, yes, okay. I, uh, yeah, there is something in my mind. I mean, I... Uh, I'd okay, like to, go ahead, Louis. I'd like to say that you... Uh, I'm very nervous. Uh, you are doing a great job, and I am uh, here to express my discontent with the mayor of uh, the New York City uh, area uh, because of what he did just now. Not just backstabbing everybody, but just trying to play politics for next time. Uh, Bob, keep up the good work. You're doing great, and don't just pay any attention to anybody. You're the best. Thank you, Louis. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Uh, don't misunderstand uh, what might seem like a nonchalant reaction about Rudy's perfidy. Uh, since I wasn't surprised, I can't pretend that I'm surprised. But if, uh, if you ever heard this phrase before, uh, here's a new one for you. I told you so. Well, Mike Long, if you're listening. Uh, Bill Bennett, if you're listening. I apologize. You guys were right. I was wrong. We would have been better off to retain David Dinkins than to have this uh, Trojan horse wheeled in. Uh, better, better to have honest opposition than uh, duplicitous allies. And, Rudy, I must tell you, what I've heard about you in the past and refused to talk about on the radio because I was a supporter of yours and I didn't want to see you have your reputation hurt, what I've heard about you from others it's true. It's true. But Rudy, I guarantee you this. If you think this is going to make you a, a big star on the political horizon, you are absolutely wrong. How do you like that? Within the space of a couple of days, Christy Whitman cuts her throat, and now Rudy cuts his throat. The only thing is, they don't know it right now. That's the only thing. They don't know it. Bobby, you're on WABC. Hello. I was want to talk about this Whitman thing, Bob. She just proved she's like every other politician. She used you, she used you, she used you. When she had no other use for you, what does she do? She knocks you down. All she cares about is herself. It just proved to me, I thought she was great, but it just proves to me, politicians don't change. They were like that since the days of Caesar. Remember Et Tu Brute? 
It's another case like that. And, Bob, no one deserves to be portrayed like that, Bob. No one, except for you. <laughs> <laughs> I knew there was something coming. I was waiting. I was waiting for the other shoe to drop. You can just tell by the cadence of his, uh, of his speech. You know what I mean? Yeah, Bob, how are you? What's on your mind, Sam? George Bataki. What do you want to say, Sam? I want to say God is going to put him as a governor, and that's the end of that. You tell that Kakazot to Rudy, he's going to got him himself. Well, I... Kakazot to just like a Mario. Yeah, I don't think he's, uh, he's concerned about what I say, obviously. Um, he, like uh, his, uh, his fellow Republican in New Jersey, used me last year. And, uh, hey, what can I tell you except uh, I agree that uh, eventually he'll regret it. At any rate, you're right, Sam. The best answer to that perfidy is to elect George Pataki. Pat, you're on WABC. Hello. Hello, Bob. Yes, sir. I just want to tell you two things. You work so hard for that person in New Jersey, that person in New Jersey. Well, she turned out to be what the minister said, a hoe, a hoe. I won't even pronounce it correctly. And then you work so hard for the other guy to get elected, this mutt who just decided he's a Democrat, this pig Giuliani. Well, they're both going to lose out because your people will prevail. And I just want you to know, man, Thank you, you did the right thing at the time, yep. and they, the rats and the hoes that they are, the two people, forget about it. Just keep doing what you're doing, Bob. And you'll be all right, and they'll be the losers. Take care. Thank you, Pat. Pat of Riverdale on the telephone line on WABC. Willie checking in from Connecticut. Hello, Willie. Hello, Bob. Uh, it's Wildy, Wildy Moore. You know, I've listened to your show. Why don't they write your name right on the screen? You, <laughs> this happened last week, too. Right, Wildy is kind of an oddball one. Uh, uh, granted, it's my Well, family. we'll just call you Will and be done I with it. I got it. Okay. Anyway, you know, I think, and I, and I really believe, we have been so, we've been groveling in what we consider politics today that we have completely lost um, all knowledge of what government really is. Government is no more than a coercive power. That's all it is. In the American society, in our old constitutional government, which I think you'll acknowledge no longer exists, government was limited to protecting life, liberty, and property. Illegitimate government that we're living under today is, is a government that redistributes property. In other words, it's, it's the game is, is uh, power and profit. Now, I'm running for office in Connecticut. It's incidental. I'm not running because I want to win. I'm running to make a statement and I can speak with a certain degree of authority. People, groups, have been writing to me and writing, and this group sells me about their power base and this power base and what they represent and send me in questionnaires and say, listen, uh, will you do this, and then we'll do this for you. And what it's told me is people really are not concerned about taking on the responsibilities that are theirs, and that responsibility includes failure in the constitutional government. So our government is totally for sale, and everyone is just groveling and saying, who's going to offer me what? In other words, we've made our government a predator, and we've totally forgotten that as being a predator government, we're the prey. So when I look at this, this Whitman and all of the rest of them, they're doing a very natural thing. All of them are doing a very natural thing. Their only interest is power and profit. And the reason they're there is because they've taken the right pack money, they've catered to this one, they've catered to that one. I was waiting for just one person, one person, to send me a letter and say, well, what I want from you is to get off my case. I'm willing to, to, to just uh, live my life. All right. Thank you very much. That's Wildy, and apparently Wildy is going to be a regular caller because we heard from him for the first time last week. Now we're hearing from him again. So remember that. If anybody calls from Connecticut, it's Wildy. Uh, Sheldon from Brooklyn, hello. Yeah, hello, Bob. I'm still in a state of shock. Unbelievable. I never thought that would happen. But I should have realized when he ran also on the liberal line, I should have realized there's something phony about that. And the most shocking thing is, more than his endorsement, what about the death penalty? 
Giuliani was always for the death penalty. I think that is the number one issue. Forget about what good is lower taxes if, if you get killed in the streets. Mario got uh, elected. Twenty thousand people were murdered, and I'm well, shocked. And, yeah, well, you're and shocked. I went for now, and a whole. To God, I'll even work harder. I want okay. Jackie more than ever to win. To Thank you, job. Sheldon. Me too. Okay, thanks. Robert, checking in on the line on WABC from New York City. Hello, Robert. Hello, Bob. How you doing? Everybody is saying how shocked they are that Rudy Giuliani has just uh, endorsed this fight team. I'm not shocked. Well, you didn't hear me say I was shocked. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I'd like to. I'm facing City Hall right now, and I'd like to say, Rodolfo, ascend me. To say Proviano Svachim, and he too is a Svachim. Absolutely. You, Take care. All right. Thank you. And uh, did you see how smug, more smug than ever, the Svachim looked? You thought he was arrogant before? What a smug look. I hope George Pataki wipes that smug look off his ugly face. Raphael, you're on WABC. Hello. Yes, hi, Robert. That must be such a good time listening to you. <laughs> um... Uh, you're not having a very nice week, politically speaking. But uh, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute, hold on, okay. hold on. I am not a politician. I don't yeah. run for public office. I haven't lost an election. So what do you mean? I'm not having a very nice well, week, politically point, speaking. You know, was, uh, I'm, I'm not having a very nice week, uh, emotionally speaking, right. because people I had faith in uh, turned out to be uh, less than honorable. But politically speaking. Nothing has damaged me one yeah. single bit. No, no, you're right. No, I, mean, I was just, uh, I happen to be, I just love to listen to you, and it's funny because I'm on the phone for the past hour listening to all these things, you know, it's so funny with the delay. And, but the reason I call you is because uh, I spoke with you once about three years ago. I'm from Argentina originally. But if you want to hear what a real Svechim is, is Governor Whitman. That is a real description for all your listeners of an Svechim. Okay. Thank you very much, You're Raphael. Welcome, Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. On WABC, I, I understood what Raphael was driving at when he said what he said, but I just want to emphasize that uh, since I'm uh, not uh, seeking public office, it doesn't have an impact on me directly. Indirectly, yes, because we need people who believe in less government. Instead, we're going to get people who obviously believe in more government. By the way, uh, Bob? Yes, Steve. Uh, how are you? I just want to call about two things. Number one, I want to call Giuliani a chameleon, but a chameleon has the ability to change his colors more than once. And uh, Giuliani, I think, committed such political suicide that that's the last time he's going to be able to change his colors. 